this look good? No, obviously it doesn't look good. It looks fucking ridiculous. I have a microphone strapped to my chest. This is this is what's happening today. That's quite big. Impressive. Yes, it is, iDubs! Yes, it is! Okay, so sometimes in world history, a state moves. That can happen in a couple different ways. A state, empire, country, whatever, is as much of an idea as it is anything concrete. It's just that this idea tends to be very widespread and encompass a bunch of interconnected social and political systems. We want these systems to be there so we can have things like order, law, and protection. And because of this, states are pretty neat things to have. For world building, I consider a state to be a group of people that has a recognized claim to land, its own population, a name, which kind of defines the idea that there is a state, and the ability to change social and political systems from the top down. Or at least try to do that. The Ottoman Empire and Chinese dynasties are named after their royal family. Britain and America currently define what makes up their states by the rules and traditions of their governments. But most importantly to our discussion today, a lot of states define themselves by what ethnic group is in charge. A lot of them, plus a lot of big empires too, like the um... The Mongols? Yeah. The Russians? Yeah. Incas? Aztecs? Comanches? Yeah. Whew. That's where we're getting. The German Empire? Not really an empire, but sure. This hurts. You get my point. A lot of states are defined by which ethnic group is in charge. After the Chinese Tang Dynasty fell in 907, there was a long period of fragmented Chinese warlord states. They all fought each other. It's bloody, full bloodbath. Don't go there. In this power vacuum rose the Khitans, a tribal confederation of nomadic warriors. Think of them as proto-Mongols. First, they conquered a bunch of other nomadic tribes north of China. And then they conquered 16 Chinese prefectures, down past modern Beijing. The loot from war and the tribute from the Chinese agricultural lands made the Khitan nobility rich, super rich. To the Chinese, this was known as the Liao Dynasty, which lasted a couple hundred years as China put itself back together under the Song Dynasty in 960. The Liao had to govern over the northern nomadic tribes and the southern Chinese agriculturalists, two totally different people. It gave rise to a double administration system. They kept their own native traditions for the North and adopted many Chinese institutions for the South. And it mostly worked. It did. Cool shit, not gonna lie. The Chinese Song Dynasty was super rich and for a lot of reasons, it was militarily, militarily weak just like my pronunciation of my native language. So the Song Dynasty would just pay the Liao not to invade or raid them anymore. So like, hey, why would you go out and risk your life on campaign when if you're an ethnic Khitan at the top of the food chain, you could just kick back and enjoy all these riches flowing in. Plus, the Liao got recognized as a legit Chinese dynasty on equal terms as the Song Dynasty, so that's pretty cool. Why have we never heard of these guys? But, uh-oh, all cushy jobs must come to an end, and basically another nomadic group called the Jurchens from Manchuria rose up against the Liao Dynasty and totally wrecked them. Ow. The Khitans got soft and lazy by not doing any conquest. By 1142, the Jurchens had swept through all of the Liao territory and took out the northern half of China. That's insane. That's bold. That's brash. During the conquest, the Jurchen took over the main Liao capital and forced them to reorganize in the south around Beijing, forming the short-lived and fucking weirdly named Northern Liao. What were you thinking? <laughs> but this defense didn't work. So what was left of the ruling Khitans gathered up some other nomadic tribes and hitched it out west. Yeah! By 1134, the Khitans had made their way to Central Asia, and they conquered a bunch of cities and they got some local tribes in on the empire building action. It's fun shit, not gonna lie. It's a party over here. 
Keton party. Woo. Now with a state in Central Asia, and pronunciation alert, they were known as the Kara Kitai, Black Ketons in the local Turkish. But the Chinese called them the Western Liao Dynasty. They existed in this way until 1211, when a prince from a different tribe in southwest Mongolia took the Western Liao throne. That guy's name was, get this, Kutchlug. Amazing! That's like a stereotypical orc name off the top of my head in Dungeons and Dragons. But the Mongols took over Kutchlug's empire in 1218. Sad. So honestly, what does all this historical nonsense actually mean? It's very hard to pin down what the Khitan state actually means after the Jurchens enter the scene. The takeover forced it to undergo extreme changes, but there was still continuity in the Khitan ethnic group, the Khitan rulers, and the name of the polity. But would you consider the short-lived Northern Liao Dynasty to be a successor of the once mighty Liao Dynasty? Or would the Karakitai be the same thing, since it was so far away and so different, even though the people at the top were generally the same? It's kind of like asking who would it be if you put Leonard Nimoy's head on Megan Fox's body. Ah, that's sickening. <laughs> I just realized I'm gonna have to edit that together. <laughs> okay, on to the example I know that you've been waiting for. Because states are so fucking complicated and have so many parts to them, you could argue with some merit, some merit, that the Roman Empire is still alive. But I'm just gonna focus on the transition from the big bad Imperium Romae to the weird metrosexual Byzantine Empire. Rome, being a big and diverse empire, was hard to govern. Shocking. There was a huge time of political instability where the empire should have fallen apart, and it almost did, but it was saved by a couple of chads. One of the later ones was Diocletian. Emperors were getting shanked left and right, but not him, because he changed the whole system around himself. He elevated three other people to power to help carry the burdens of administration. The empire was split into four parts between the four, with Diocletian at the top. This is called the Tetrarchy and it remained stable until Diocletian left the picture. That's the first time that the empire was purposefully politically split, but afterwards it just set the roster for the ensuing civil wars. These civil wars ended when a familiar guy named Constantine, who consolidated power in the west, beat the guy who consolidated power in the east. By this point, Rome itself was strategically useless. Other cities like Milan and Ravenna became the centers of power in the west, and a few emperors never even stepped foot in the Eternal City. Ouch. Imagine once being the center of the world and then your own leader doesn't even care about you. <sighs> well, much of the empire's wealth, population, and required military force was situated in the east. And because the Senatus Populusque Romanus had basically lost all their political power to the Emperor, Constantine could just up and move the capital to a more strategically sound place, Constantinople. The East and West remained politically divided, but they both took a beating in the 5th century. Rome was sacked multiple times. And the Germanic tribes that had been settled in the West and that for some reason were allowed to maintain their tribal identities and leadership rose in power. By this time, leaders of the East generally wouldn't aid the West against the Germanic tribes or the Huns. They had their own Germans and Huns to worry about. Also, a little problem empire named Persia? So in 476, Odoacer came into Italy and officially stripped the Western Roman Emperor of his title which gives us the first hard date for when the Byzantine Empire started. But the Byzantines didn't see themselves as anything different than Roman. This change in empire isn't as much a migration of the state as a migration of its center of power. While life in the West was unstable and fatal, People reorganized into smaller settlements that were less reliant on trade and faraway state armies, while the East stayed fairly metropolitan and maintained the complicated social systems that allowed for their large empire. But don't get me wrong, the East had plenty of its own problems, just watch any history channel. But it is worth noting that it lasted for a thousand more years. But was this a continuation of the Roman Empire, or was it another state entirely? Unlike the Liao, we can't define the state by a certain ruling ethnic group. 
The Byzantines carried on and further developed many of the late Roman social systems, like its law and Christianity. But the East also had its own identity that was dominated by Greek culture, not to mention its own unique enemies like Slavs and Avars. Plus, many of the socio-political systems that it inherited from the Roman Empire soon became unrecognizable as it adapted to the medieval era. Oh, and it was centered in this brand spanking new metropolis. Wow, look at that geography! But between all of that, many Byzantine Romans genuinely believed that the East would reunite the lands of Rome and reestablish the Eternal Empire. It was just that. It was the, the Empire. There was no Western world without it. It was the Western world as far as the inhabitants of the Empire were concerned. It had existed for a thousand years before it fell. But the closest the Byzantines got to reuniting the Empire was with Justinian the Great about 50 years after Odoacer took over Rome. And it didn't last too long. So was Byzantium another state or a continuation of the Roman Empire? Hint hint, there's no real answer to that because these terms oversimplify all of this. And the collapse of part of an empire and the survival of another part is anything but simple. Let me wrap this up with a question. If Canada, Puerto Rico, Togo, and Florida carved up everything east of the Mississippi, do you think the West would still consider itself American? Where do you think the new capital would be? And why is California smiling? I'm scared! This video, which I had a lot of fun making, was made from my beautiful Patreons over on Patreon.com. Newt Newt, mwah. Ben Snow, mwah. Aiden Davenport, oh, ooh, mwah. Woo! Oh. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Flint and Shadow Eleven, you're also the best. Here's my cat, just to show you that you're also the best because you subscribed after I recorded that video. Okay, she wants down. 